So in this lecture of Unit 3, we're going to talk about amino acid metabolism during fasting. But before we do that, we're going to talk about the metabolism of branch chain amino acids because they play such a critical role in amino acid metabolism during fasting. So first, just an overview. So what are the branch chain amino acids? There's three of them. And so if you look at the structure here, so here's your alpha carbon, which every amino acid has. Here's the carboxyl group. Here's the amino group. And as you can see here, for all of them, here's the alpha carbon for all three of them, where they have these highly branched R groups, because remember, the R groups are what distinguish each amino acid. So they have these highly branched R groups, and that's hence where they get their name, branch chain amino acids. So this is a structure for leucine, isoleucine, and valine. So branch chain amino acids, they play a key role in providing amino groups for the synthesis of glutamine and alanine in the muscle tissue during fasting. So here's this figure, muscle tissue. This is, a, this is a figure in your book, and we'll go through this entire figure step by step later in the lecture. But here we're going to just focus on, if you look at branch chain amino acids, so here's that transamination going on, and here's glutamate being produced here that then can be used for glutamine synthesis. And then here's also where glutamate produced from this reaction can be combined with pyruvate to produce alanine. So the first step here, again, transamination. So you have branch chain amino acids, and then you have alpha ketoglutarate which receives that amino group from, the, from a branch chain amino acid that generates glutamate. And then here you, bran you generate branch chain keto acids, and these get exported out into the blood and then go to the liver for further metabolism. And again, this reaction is catalyzed by branch chain amino acid aminotransferase. So once they're in the liver, these branch chain keto acids will combine with NAD plus and then CoA, SH, and then will be converted into branch chain CoA derivatives and then NADH, and this is catalyzed by the enzyme branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. So these branch chain CoA derivatives of valine and isoleucine are further broken down into propanyl CoA, which can enter gluconeogenesis, which as you recall is an important process that's occurring during fasting in the liver because it's synthesizing new glucose to be used by peripheral tissues. And then the branch chain CoA derivative of leucine is broken down into acetoacetate and acetyl-CoA, which are both ketogenic. So a quick clinical pearl here for branch chain amino acids, maple syrup disease. So this involves branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase enzyme. So this enzyme is defective or it requires B1 as a cofactor. So B1 is deficient. So they have a vitamin B1 deficiency. And so just to point out here quickly, the other cofactors used obviously B1, like we said, lipoic acid, CoA, FAD, and NAD. And there's high levels of this enzyme present in the muscle. And that's apparent by our previous discussion where we talked about breakdown of, of branch chain amino acids in the muscle tissue during fasting. And so as a result of this, branch chain amino acids, they cannot be degraded. And so they build up in the blood. And then branch chain amino acids, and more so their branch chain keto acids, when they get broken down, are very toxic in high levels. And so the inheritance for this is autosomal recessive. And so these high levels of branch chain amino acids and branch chain keto acids can really affect neurological development and the function of neurological tissue. So you can see mental retardation in patients. You can also see hypoglycemia because of the effects on metabolism during fasting and then vomiting. And then also, again, these neurological effects can manifest as lethargy, hypotonia, or hypertonia. You can see ketosis. And then the distinguishing characteristic of this disease is that the urine has a particular odor. It smells very sweet or sugar or like maple syrup. That's where this disease gets its name. And then unfortunately, these patients succumb to an early death. The way you treat these patients is you supplement with B1, thiamine, and then avoid all branch chain amino acids in the diet because they're unable to break them down. All right, so now we're going to discuss amino acid metabolism during fasting and starvation. So during prolonged fasting, muscle protein is broken down into amino acids. So here's this diagram that we'll walk through. Here's the muscle here. And the majority of the amino acids released from the muscle during fasting are alanine and glutamine. And we've talked about alanine's role in gluconeogenesis during the gluconeogenesis lecture. We'll talk about it again here. So first, alanine synthesis in the muscle. It begins with pyruvate, actually. Now, there's a few sources of pyruvate. First, you can have conversion of serine, cysteine, threonine, and glycine into pyruvate. This really shouldn't be listed under the muscle. This is more so in the liver in the small intestine because Pepsi-K is present in the liver, obviously because the liver carries out gluconeogenesis, and then Pepsi-K is also present in the small intestine, small amounts, because as you see down here, this is the small intestine, and you're going to have pyruvate. We'll talk about this in a couple slides, so I apologize for any confusion about that, but it, again, you can get pyruvate 
from phosphoenolpyruvate during gluconeogenesis, which is catalyzed by PEPCK, but just not in the muscle. So, and then lastly here, you can have conversion of malate to pyruvate by malate dehydrogenase. So again, starting with pyruvate here in the muscle. And so what you have is this reaction catalyzed by alanine aminotransferase. Now remember, that's a bi-directional enzyme. You know, originally when we discussed it, we talked about alanine combining with alpha ketoglutarate to yield pyruvate and glutamate. Here we're going backwards. So we're starting with pyruvate, we take a glutamate, and we convert it into an alpha ketoglutarate. We release an ammonia group as a result of that, and then we generate an alanine. That alanine then gets exported out of the muscle into the blood, where then it gets transported to the liver. And remember, we dis discussed this during the gluconeogenesis lecture. Alanine is, undergoes transamination the other direction back to pyruvate, generates a glutamate, and then that pyruvate undergoes gluconeogenesis to form glucose. Then what's interesting here is that glucose, remember the liver carries out gluconeogenesis to produce glucose not for, to be used in the liver, but to be used by peripheral tissues. So that glucose produced by gluconeogenesis gets exported back out into the blood, and muscle is certainly peripheral tissue, so it takes up that glucose and then uses it again to undergo glycolysis all the way down to pyruvate and generating energy for the tissue. The other thing we'll make a note of here is that the ammonia generated by this first transamination reaction eventually gets converted into urea and is excreted. So glutamine synthesis stems from the fact that glutamate is generated by transamination of amino acids in the muscle. And since so many of these transamination reactions are occurring in the muscle, glutamate is widely available. So if we show here, we, here we have where it's branch chain amino acids, could be other amino acids undergoing transamination. Point is, is you have alpha ketoglutarate as the main amino group acceptor in most transamination reactions, which then gets converted into glutamate. So you have a large pool of glutamate available in the cell as a result of these transamination, whether it's branch chain amino acids or other amino acids. So as you can see in the diagram here, glutamate can go really two couple different ways here. And you may be wondering, well, which way does it go? And really it goes both because you want to think of this as you have, again, you have so much glutamate available. You, have, you want to think of this as a large pool of glutamate. Some of it gets used by combining with oxyl acetate to form aspartate. And then some of it gets combined with ammonia to form glutamine, catalyzed by the enzyme glutamine synthesase, and it utilizes one molecule of ATP. And because of this, glutamine synthase has high activity in muscle tissue. So this ammonia needed for glutamine synthesis is produced by the purine nucleotide cycle. Now the purine nucleotide cycle involves producing ammonia as a result of the aspartate used to convert IMP to AMP. So some of this glutamate that was generated by transamination, remember we have a large pool of glutamate, some of it is being used by combining with oxyl acetate to generate aspartate. This is catalyzed by the enzyme aspartate aminotransferase, which is also a bidirectional enzyme. So as a result, you yield alpha ketoglutarate. This aspartate then enters into the purine nucleotide cycle, where it combines with IMP to generate AMP and then fumarate. So you see fumarate as a part of that reaction. It also yields ammonia. This is the ammonia that then is used by combining with glutamate to form glutamine, which is catalyzed by glutamine synthase. And then this fumarate gets converted into malate, and then the malate gets converted into oxyl acetate by malate dehydrogenase. And so you've regenerated the oxyl acetate that then again can convert with available glutamate to regenerate aspartate, and the cycle continues. So as we said before, branch chain amino acid conversion to branch chain keto acids in the muscle provide a significant amount of ammonia for the synthesis of alanine and glutamine in the muscle. So we talked about alanine. Now we've talked about the synthesis of glutamine. Now after it's synthesized in the muscle, it gets exported into the blood, and it first goes to the kidney, where it's used to titrate the acidity of the tubular urine. Any glutamine that does not go to the kidney then goes to the gut, where then it is broken down into alpha-ketoglutarate via two steps. So first you have glutamine, being converted into glutamate, and that's catalyzed by an enzyme called glutaminase. We talked about this reaction in the first amino acid metabolism lecture, amino acid catabolism. So then glutamate is broken down into alpha ketoglutarate via transamination. And just remember, these am amino groups that are being generated by these reactions eventually go to the liver for conversion to urea. 
So the alpha ketoglutarate generated in the small intestine then enters the citric acid cycle, where it's eventually oxidized to malate. Malate gets exported from the mitochondria to the cytosol, where there it's, then it's converted into oxaloacetate by malate dehydrogenase. And remember, we mentioned this previously, that the small intestine contains cytosolic Pepsi-K, which then converts oxaloacetate into phosphoenolpyruvate. Phosphoenolpyruvate is then converted into pyruvate via pyruvate kinase. Now, this is not a futile cycle because that pyruvate is then used to synthesize alanine via alanine aminotransferase. So pyruvate undergoes transamination to generate alanine, which also yields alpha-ketoglutarate. And then alanine exits the small intestine. It travels in the blood and then travels back to the liver, where then it is converted back to pyruvate, and then undergo, where pyruvate undergoes gluconeogenesis to synthesize glucose, which is then exported out of the liver to be used by peripheral tissues. So again, just to kind of summarize what this is all about in the end. So remember, we started out with talking about branched chain amino acids that undergo transamination to generate this large pool of glutamate. Glutamate is used to synthesize alanine, and then glutamate is also used to synthesize glutamine. And remember, those are really our two primary end products here. So you th synthesize glutamine and alanine in the muscle during fasting and starvation. So the end uses of alanine, remember you use alanine to synthesize pyruvate, which is then used to undergo gluconeogenesis to generate glucose in the liver. And remember, the liver does not use the glucose it generates during gluconeogenesis. It's using fatty acids. So this glucose generated by the liver during fasting is exported out into the blood to be used by peripheral tissues. Muscles are included in peripheral tissues, so they take up this glucose and then convert it into pyruvate via glycolysis to generate energy for the muscle. And then glutamine here is used by first the kidney to titrate the acidity of the tubular urine, and then also in the small intestine, it's used here to generate more alanine that can then also be used by the liver to generate glucose to be used by peripheral tissues. All right, so that concludes our discussion of branched chain amino acid metabolism and the amino acid metabolism during fasting and starvation. And then that also concludes our lectures on amino acid metabolism. Next, we'll have a summary lecture to kind of tie up all the different components of metabolism that we've talked about.